Hi, welcome to Life of the Rock. Tonight our guest is Dom Qualia. He's a Catholic speaker, reaches out to uh, young people especially, has a great talk on St. Joseph, and he's going to share some of his thoughts about uh, youth ministry and working with young men. So we're happy to have him here with us tonight. Yep. Good to see you, Doug. You too, Father. And I've got to give a shout, shout out to a uh, brother priest in my community, Father Miguel. He is taking a pilgrimage uh, to Poland in celebration of the Year of Mercy. Uh, it's, the dates are April 21st through May 1st. It's to Poland and to Prague, and they're going to be visiting, uh, you know, all the religious sites there, and, uh, and the theme will be uh, the Year of Mercy pilgrimage. So I um, hope we have some contact information on the screen if you'd like to join him. I know they work real hard to keep the rates low and cost of it down, so he's an excellent uh, spiritual guide, and uh, I'm sure it'll be a fruitful pilgrimage for all who go. So. Yeah. Now we are almost at Christmas. We're in the heart of Advent here. See. And I'm going to choose. I, I thought something from the scripture that might not at first seem very Adventy, but if we go to John 19, we're told that when Jesus is being crucified on the cross, we're told when Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing near, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. And that is a very powerful theme for Advent. Uh, we're celebrating the coming of Christ, the birth of Christ. And Mary is his mother and our spiritual mother. That he's entrusting her to, to us, that, uh, that we are to receive that. But also, he's giving her a mission and her role as mother in the order of grace for us. That these graces that Jesus is winning for us on the cross at that moment, she's going to be a mediatrix of these graces mm. for us. She's going to bring forth this, these gifts of eternal life to us. So that's a great meditation for us during Advent because we say her motherhood begins at the Annunciation, right? She conceived Jesus in the womb, but at the foot of the cross, at this moment of our redemption, it, goes, it undergoes this transformation, this universalization that She's, it's imbued with, her motherhood's imbued with this burning charity, that she's taken right. up in the charity, the love that Jesus has for us. And so he tells her, you know, you have this role to be a mother to John. Yeah. So the burden is more on her even, you know, so she's got this new role. Yeah, you're right, because it is easy, I think, sometimes to look at that statement from the cross and think that John just takes care mm -hmm. of her now and yeah. she's just going to live out her days mm -hmm. until the assumption. Right. La di da, you know. Right, I mean, not right. to diminish it, yeah. but it is easy to fall into that yeah. rather than seeing it more as there's a mission here. She right. she is now mission. given as the mother of the world. You know? Right. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, one of the things that I, I do with my own children uh, on their birthdays is I remind them that the birthday isn't just about them. And any of the mothers in the audience might get this as well, could be because you were there as well, mm -hmm. right? You gave birth. <laughs> you were there. It's not just your birthday. I was part of the process. Mm -hmm. You know, the woman. So we think about even Advent, we think about the birth of Christ. Wonderful, absolutely, but we can't forget that there's a significance to the fact that God chose it to be done this way, brings Mary into the equation in a very profound way. And at what point into the equation? Mm. At the heart of redemption. Right. He's hanging on the cross at the culmination of redemption, winning for us his graces. That's when he brings Mary in. Yeah, and I think about the fact that you know, she is looking at her son hanging on that cross and the flesh that hangs on this cross, the, the body of our Lord that is given for the sins of mankind to redeem the world came entirely from her body. So she is seeing this, this connection here of her own child hanging there from her flesh mm -hmm. now laid upon the cross for the world's uh, you know, salvation. It, 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 is, it is one of those mysteries that I think of, many of the mysteries of our faith, I think of St. Therese in so many words, to paraphrase her, saying that there are certain mysteries that you just really shouldn't try to talk too much about <laughs> because there's certain, you just can't find yeah. the right words to talk right. about how yeah. amazing and profound they are. Yeah. But these are mysteries that must be meditated on. Yeah. You know, and really shame on us and how sad for us if we let Advent go by and don't take time to delve into something deeper. It's so easy to get caught up in all the other things going on. Yeah. You know, the, the important things, family right. and decorations right. and, and gifts and such have their place, but, but boy, to miss the gift of this, this time of the year to meditate on these mysteries and right. link them to the cross because he, mm -hmm. he came into the world, 
so that he would grow to be a man and then die. Right. Rise from the yeah. grave, ascend and open the gates of heaven. Yeah. And John is the model for us. He says, and from that hour, the disciple took her to his own mm. home. You know, Pope Benedict, in commenting on this passage, he said, it's deeper than home is a, is a really a poor translation. It, the, the phrase means like into one's inner being, into one's inner reality. Mm -hmm. So it's a deep kind of uh, mystery that Mary's got this role that, to bring forth this life into our very souls. It's you know? not just, Mary, I have a room for you off the living room here. <laughs> right. This is where you'll stay. Yeah, I mean, he would have, <laughs> he would have provided for her care before right. the moment of hanging on the cross. So it's a deep theological but mystery. It's a deeper encounter of the yeah, relationship yeah. That, 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 right. that must right. go to, uh, to another yeah. level. Yeah. Yeah. And to think of that, that Mary has this role over us to be our spiritual mother so we can just entrust ourselves to her prayers that she will prepare us uh, for the proper celebration of Christmas. She will prepare our hearts to receive him. You know, she's the mediatrix of all graces. I, you know, I, I say I remember when I was, I had this conversion experience after college and when I, when I got that point, I said, yeah, I'm going to pray to Mary. You know, <laughs> she's the mediatrix of all yeah. graces. If all those graces won by Christ come to us through her, then we better have a devotion to it. Yeah, pretty smart thing to do. Pretty smart. Okay, we're gonna take a quick break. <laughs> we'll be back with Dom Qualia. Don't go away, back in a moment. Welcome back to Life on the Rock. Thanks for joining us. I'm Doug Barry along with Father Mark. We are the Rock House Compadres, the official Rock House Compadres, by the way. Have to make mention of that. We have Dom Qualia with us here, speaker and author, Catholic presenter extraordinaire. Dom, good to have you on the yeah, show. Thanks for having yeah, me. Nice to, be, nice to have you. Your wife has been on the show. No, I'm sorry, not your wife. Um, your uh, Sorry, your wife is a singer. That's what I was going to say. Your yes. wife is a, is a Catholic singer. Forgive yes, me about that. Sarah Kroger. She, Sarah uh, Kroger, that's she's, right. She's shocked she hasn't been. I think she's a little bit bitter that that's, I'm here before her. That's, yeah. There's competition <laughs> in the marriage going on. Yeah. 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 Uh, and you've been married just a few months now, or two, three months? Yeah, isn't? two and a half months. So, I mean, we're pros, obviously, by this point. <laughs> um, we're doing a mentorship program for all the couples who've been married less than us. So, oh, you know, good for you. Baby couples. Like, yeah. you know, if they've been married like a month, we're yeah. catching them up to speed. So, it's, that's you good. Know, do what we can. Yeah. That's, awesome. yeah. That's awfully nice of you. Yeah. That's very good of you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but marriage going well for you so, so far? So well. It's been an absolute blast. She's my best friend, challenges me, motivates me, and, and we're just having the best time being together. Yeah. That's awesome. That's good. And she is a, a musician and singer. Yeah. She, she's a Catholic recording artist. She does you know youth conferences and retreats just like I do. So it's really fun being able to work together because we kind of, the, the one-two punch, you know, I, I bring the message and she brings the worship and she's so gifted at leading people into worship. She really has a, mm -hmm. has a great heart for it. So uh, it's really fun to, to be in the same field. You know what I mean? We can understand each other. All right, a little background on this point then. And we didn't discuss this for the show, but I got to throw this at you here. Um, how did you meet her? We met at a at church, at our home parish. We grew up okay. together. Yeah. All right. And how did you first ask her out? Okay. So let's see. I first asked her out. For, so we had become like really, really great friends. You know, we'd become just, you know, almost like brother and sister. And I was kind of worried that we were like brother and sister now. And that's not <laughs> what I wanted, you know. And I was so, I was so nervous about finally <laughs> telling her that I had feelings for her. I didn't want to ruin the friendship. And we had, uh, we had fi just finally bubbled up to where we were, we had finally had a moment alone together. We were in the car on the way home from Disney World, actually. And uh, I finally said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell her. I'm just going to ask her what, what she wants from me because I wanted to like, love her the best way I could. And I thought, if she thinks that that's as a friend, I'll continue to do that. But if she's feeling what I'm feeling, then maybe we can take you know, the next step. So I had a backup plan. I was going if to, if, if, if it didn't go the way I wanted to, I was definitely going to jump out of the car. You know what I mean? <laughs> I was, so I was, so I, had, I was like, had my hand on the handle. While it was moving. <laughs> While it was moving, absolutely. We're on the highway. Um, and so I said to Sarah, and I just kind of expressed her how I was feeling, and she totally felt the same way, and she was just, you know, uh, wow. so she felt so firm that, I, that we were on the same page, and it was beautiful. So, uh, of course, we, after that, we discerned for a little while, and she, uh, mostly I c continued to wait for her to be, to be ready, and then 
we finally started dating on the beach, our, our favorite place on yeah, the beach. Yeah, very nice. And and so then, how did you propose to her? <laughs> so I proposed to her. I so we had a fantastic day. Uh, at, we we love Disney, by the way. We're from Orlando, so we had a great day. We're from Florida, so we had a great day at Disney. And I took her to this fancy French restaurant in Disney that. Uh, she had always wanted to go to, but never been to, and it's, By the it's little Eiffel Tower. Yes, yes. yeah, on the, on the second floor. <laughs> I've been there. Yeah, it's fantastic. I was a teenager so, when I was there, but <laughs> yeah, so it's a, it's a great place. She's always wanted to go there. A lot of people who go to Disney don't even know these places exist, and uh, I, I you have to get reservations like months in advance. So I did get reservations. I I was acting the whole day like I didn't have any dinner plans. I was like, they, they got those pretzels. We'll get something. Like don't worry, you know. And it was our two year anniversary of dating. And she was really upset that I hadn't found anything for dinner. Little did she know I had reservations, of course. So I bring her into the French place, and she's making a whole big scene. No, we're not going here. I, she couldn't believe it, you know. So I, I, you know, I calmed her down. We go into the restaurant. We had the greatest time. We had a window right by. Uh, we had a table right by the window. Got to see the fireworks right outside our our dinner table. And um, she doesn't really eat a lot of red meat, and she do, she doesn't really like steak. I love steak, so I get the steak. Well, she was inspired by my choice. And the one time in my life I've ever seen her order a steak, she waits till it's sixty-five dollars at this restaurant. <laughs> and that night she felt in a, the mood for steak, so she gets steak that night. So I made sure she ate every ounce of it. Yeah. And we had a great meal, and uh, and we went back to the chapel at our home parish on the beach where we grew up in Florida. And I took her into the chapel and right by the Mary statue, which is a, a place that we had gone and prayed um, several times when we were dating. And there's a piano in there. We used to always sing and worship together. And I and I took her in there and I just told her how much uh, she reminds me of Mary and how the way Mary leads us to Christ, how I was really hoping that she would do that for me for the rest of my life, lead me to Christ. So, and then I, I proposed there and, and she said yes and we danced and she screamed for like, you know, half an hour or whatever. And then we just called all of our friends and just, yeah, started the celebration. <laughs> it, it was awesome. And then uh, got she, right to it. She's screaming in the church. Anybody praying is leaving. You know? Yes, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> it was it was awesome. So well, it was that's really a, great. That's incredible. All right. Yeah. Well, okay. Well, thanks for watching the show tonight, folks. <laughs> and uh, there you have uh, Dom Qualia. And okay, so back to a little bit about yourself. Though, have you always been uh, Catholic? You always been faithful? Tell us a bit about yourself yeah. and what brings you to being involved in, in ministry work. Yeah. So that's a great question. So I, I've always been Catholic. Uh, uh, and I, I really actually always enjoyed Mass. I always, uh, I, I, my father Nolan, our parish priest, who actually recently passed away, uh, he was an excellent homilist. And I always, even when I really didn't care about my faith, I always listened, I respected him. I listened to what he had to say. Went, went to church every Sunday. It didn't really mean much. I always paid attention to, you know, CCD and confirmation classes, all that kind of thing. I got all my sacraments got confirmed. And for me, that was kind of graduation. And I thought, this is great. I really had a great time being a churchgoer, <laughs> but now I'm on. in eighth grade. It's time to move on, yeah. bigger, better things. <laughs> well, I got to ninth grade, and uh, there were some really pretty girls going on the, the, the fall <clears throat> retreat. And I thought, well, I guess I ought to go on the fall retreat. So I went, not really caring too much about the faith, but definitely interested in the girls. And uh, Saturday night, we get, we're getting ready for this thing, and uh, some buddies of mine had stolen a schedule from the adult leaders. So we were looking at the schedule, figuring out what was next. And we said, Saturday night, there's this thing called adoration. What in the world is that? And why is there three hours on the schedule for this thing called adoration? We were like, we never, is it a movie? Maybe it's got to it's be a movie. So, <laughs> so we're getting ready for this mo movie night. You know, we go into the main room, you know, thinking it's going to be a movie called adoration. And we get in there. And, you know, the, the priest brings in the monstrance with the Blessed Sacrament and everybody around me is having these different experiences and, you know, some people are really into it and they're praying, some people are crying and, and everyone's having these, these, this real encounter and I just kept my eyes fixed on the Eucharist but I had no idea what was happening. But when I left the room that night, I distinctively remember walking around, it was a beautiful campsite, I remember walking around looking up at the stars and, and just kind of, you know, I wasn't even talking to anybody, I just remember thinking, okay, there's something to this faith that I don't understand. And even more so, I think, I think there's something to this life on earth that I'm living that I don't understand yet because whatever happened in that room was real and it was powerful and I don't get it wow. and I want to get it and I want to understand it. And that sort of set me on this path to figure out what just happened in that room and what, what, who, what or who is this Jesus person, you know? And so uh, a few months later, I had really formulated some thoughts about my experience on the retreat and my youth minister at the time asked me to share with the other kids about my experience. And that was my that was kind of my first time giving a talk, if you will. I finally put together some thoughts on a piece of paper and gave a, a presentation about my experience on the retreat. And I guess you know my youth minister saw something in the way I was able to present or something, and um, it just slowly spread from there. Another church down the road said, "Hey, I heard you gave a presentation to to those kids. Would you come give one to our kids?" Mm -hmm. And it just and then it started spreading to other towns and other states. And, and now I've, I've been doing it full time for four years. Yeah. Wow.
Okay. So it's basically just been witnessing about, about my encounters with Jesus. That's all I do. Uh, but this moment of adoration, I won't go back to that for a second, because to me, that's one of those, you know, those mysteries. Yeah. You know, it's one of those yeah. profound moments that something just, ah, I can't explain it. Right. Did you ask anybody? Did you talk to anybody? Did you go to a priest? Did you, yes, I did. did. Our, yeah, I went to parents. Uh, who? I, I went to our youth minister and our, and our parish priest, and both of them were really able to help me understand. First of all, what the church teaches about adoration, because I wasn't even catechized to understand that much. You know, uh, what what was that? What was that? Are they allowed to take? First of all, I was actually kind of upset because I was like. Did, did they take that from mass? Did they, like, are they allowed to do that? You know, that's supposed to be a, you know, and so I was kind of, kind of like, you know, trying to figure out if everything was kosher, you know, and, and they, they explained to me, yeah, th th that's, this is a beautiful thing that's been happening in our church for a long time, Eucharistic Adoration, where Jesus is. For a long time. Yeah. For, a couple uh, of thousand yeah, they, they, they didn't make it up, you know, this, this church didn't make it up. So, uh, and so I was really, I was really so interested in it because I knew that I felt something very powerful. I felt a tangible love in the room from something that, of course, to somebody who doesn't know any better, seemed inanimate. It right. seems just like a piece of bread, you know? And so I went on this, this journey of trying to figure out what is Eucharistic Adoration all about? And when I really let it sink in that God loves us so much that He wants to be with us and that He's willing to be confined to a piece of bread so that He can be with us, so that He could actually be inside of us, I just was blown away that I could be loved wow. that much. And I thought, if, some, if, if somebody loves me that much, I want to love them back. And so how do I do that? How do I love them back? How do I love Him back? And that was what started my journey of wanting to be a, a follower, you know? That's incredible. I mean, it really is. So when you, when you speak, because you, you speak publicly now, this is really what you do. Um, do you tell the story of the adoration? Yeah, much? yeah, and I, and, I, and I, you know, again, I try, um, I try to be careful the way I tell it, because I don't want to set other, t other kids who are getting ready to have, you know, some teenagers coming into a room who've never experienced adoration. I don't want to, you know, sort of project my experience onto them. Right. So normally I'll, I'll tell it after adoration. Well, once they've had their experience, mm -hmm. I'll say, hey, if, if, if this is where you are, if you're sitting there going, what just happened? I want you to know that I was there and I want to encourage you to seek, you know, have some questions, seek some answers, seek this Jesus who, who loves you. Uh, if you have questions, don't be afraid to ask. You what know kind, what I mean? What kind of feedback do you get from young people in particular when you tell the story then after they've had the experience of adoration then they hear you speak does anybody come up and say whoa yeah me too or anything yeah, like that yeah most most of the time there's an overwhelming number of, of teens who go i'm so glad you said that we're allowed to ask questions because i wasn't sure if i was allowed to i thought maybe i was supposed to just know what's going on <laughs> and I, I think i mean you'll find the people whoever found me when i first got here knows i'm not afraid to ask questions hey where am i staying where do i go where's dinner <laughs> I, I really emphasize the where's dinner question. You know, I'm always asking <laughs> questions everywhere I go. I'm asking, I, I was just asking Debbie before, so where do I put my stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. I'm always asking questions if I don't know the answer. And so I, I would encourage them, hey, if you don't know what's going on, ask somebody. Your priests right. are here to help you, you know? Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, and, and so uh, when, you, when you're giving the talks, what, what, what size crowds are you normally working with? Yeah, you know, th this is the great thing about what I do, and I love, I love it so much. I, I speak to any number of, so, you know, uh, I've spoken to a crowd of 5,000 before at a big youth rally, and that, that time was particularly fun because I had all my notes for the talk written down on my iPad, and I was getting ready to go out in front of 5,000, and two seconds before I walk on stage, the stage manager tells me they don't have a podium for my iPad. And so he just takes my iPad and kind of pushes me out onto the stage, and there I am in front of all these people <laughs> with, with no you know, notes. my notes gone. So luckily I had practiced it enough to, to be able to give the talk. But, and then sometimes, you know, and then I remember that, that weekend on Saturday I spoke to that huge crowd, and on Sunday I was at a, a ch small church and I was speaking to 15. And I, I to me there was no difference. Okay. You know what I mean? Big yeah. crowds, small crowds, it's, it's it's all just an opportunity to get to know people. Where, and to, where in this process, though, did you did you kind of come to think to yourself that this is what I'm I'm called to do, and really throw myself my life into this? Yeah, you know, it's it's funny. It was it was almost as soon as that very first talk, when the feeling of being able to witness to others what I had seen, and I mean, you know, this is a direct command, you know, from from Acts of the Apostles. We have to witness to what we have seen and heard, you know, mm -hmm. um, and that, that's I felt that immediately my first time ever witnessing to people about my experience. It was so fulfilling to be able to and, and just to be honest, to, mm -hmm. to be honest and say, this is what I saw. This is what I felt. I think this is what God might be doing in my life. And uh, but obviously, once I started to be able to sort of support myself doing mm -hmm. it is when I realized, oh, maybe I can actually do this. And right. so the supporting myself doing it is still kind of a 
daily battle, you know. <laughs> but but I don't care about that. It's just so yeah. much fun to, to do yeah. it. I've been doing it for 25 years, and yeah. it's still a daily battle. <laughs> so yeah, don't be yeah. discouraged on that. We're gonna go take a break. When we come back, though, I want to get into a little bit about about your message, because I, I you know I like when we talked a little bit before um, some of the things that are really on your heart. Let's get into that a little bit, uh, and and really help people understand. Um, some of the hurt that's going on in the world and, and you know, yeah. w w what do we need to do to address it? You know, really get after it a bit. So we're going to run to a break now. Don't go away. We'll be back more with Dom after this. back. Thanks for being with us. I'm Doug Barry, along with Father Mark. The Rock House compadres are with you. Life on the Rock, you're in the Rock House. And with us is Dom Qualia. You are youth ministry extraordinaire, Catholic speaker and author. Yeah, and uh, for um, and married just a couple, two and a half or so months. Yes, so, it's been fantastic. I really especially like the fact that you're putting on little uh, sessions for the younger married couples, which is very nice of you. <laughs> yeah, well, you, you learn a lot in your first, you know, like I, I always think, Man, I'm so unlike St. Joseph. And that's, that's what's been, I, I'm trying to be more like St. <laughs> Joseph, but in my, in my short married life so far, I, am, I have very little in common with him. I mean, he, he had no problem waking up in the middle of the night, moving Mary and Jesus you know, across the, across yeah. the town or you know, whatever to get, to get away from Herod. And, and I, my wife asked me to drive her to the airport at five in the morning a couple of days ago. And let's say I complain more than St. Joseph complains, <laughs> I'm saying, you know, but you learn so much. I mean, I remember thinking of that St. That John Vianney quote, uh, our sins are nothing but a, a grain of sand alongside the mountain of God's mercy. And I just thought there's so many connections to that. You know, you know, she mm -hmm. helps me understand God's mercy so much by the way she forgives me. But also that quote, you know, like my closet space is nothing but a grain of sand alongside the mountain of our actual closet. You know, <laughs> or uh, like, you know, the, the bottles that I have in the shower are nothing but a grain of sand alongside the mountain of bottles she has in the shower. <laughs> you know, so so I'm constantly learning about God through my wife and I, I love her very much for that. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, thanks for being with us tonight. Uh, once again, uh, the showstopper on that one, that's good. Okay, um, what's on your heart when you speak? You know, I, you know, we don't have a lot of time in a show, um, you know, to really get into all the details of all the different things that you've probably spoken about or can speak about. So if you really were to narrow it down, you know, we yeah. talked about this beforehand, but I like, I like just kind of get to the heart of, you know, when, when, when you walk into a crowd and you, you see these people there that God has presented to you, he's entrusted to your care for this particular opportunity to speak to them about him, whether it's five or 500 or 5,000, you know, what, what is it you really feel you want to convey to them? Yeah. You feel God has put on your heart. Yeah. I, I think the main thing, I just want to be honest with them about my journey because I know that all of them are on a journey. You know, every single person that we come in contact with is on a journey. And at times, depending on what's going on in their life, maybe a difficult journey. And uh, I want to be honest with them about my journey with the Lord because I can, I can feel ever since, like I told you guys about that first adoration, I, can, I could feel Jesus in the Eucharist drawing me to himself. And my prayer during that adoration was, Lord, if this is really you, if this is something real, help me connect with you. I, and young people, I think, need to know that they can connect with God and that God and, and Jesus does want to connect with them. And so my, my, what's on my heart when I, see, when I walk into a room and I'm speaking to a crowd is that I know that they're on a journey and I just want to help that journey along. And mm -hmm. I want to be, and the best way I do that is just being honest with my journey, my struggles. Uh, I, I love to break open the scriptures. I think especially in, in Catholic crowds, sometimes we don't know our scripture as well as we should. And so I love breaking open the gospel stories and revealing to people how much Jesus loves them. And if I can do that through a funny story from my own life, tie it in with some scripture, mm -hmm. you know, um, that, that people would understand they're loved. I mean, I think we, we have to know and we have to at least try to, to grasp and to grapple with every day how much we're loved, this radical, amazing love. And if we can do that every day, I think every day is a good day, you know. And do you think that had anything to do with your, your encounter with adoration? The fact that, you know, you're, you're there before Jesus. And I know you had said that, you know, earlier that you weren't... Um, you weren't sure whether you were actually praying or something to that effect? Yeah. But there was something happening there. Would you describe it as uh, love? 
Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, Jesus, no doubt, was trying to share his love with me. He was trying to invite me, and God calls us to himself. And, uh, and I think St. Therese said, prayer is, is a surge of the heart towards God. And so I know that I was praying, even though I didn't necessarily know I was praying. I may not have started you know, with the sign of the cross, but I was praying because my heart was surging towards God. And I didn't even know what that meant at the time. And that was what set me on the journey to figure out what is this all about. But I know that Jesus was calling me to himself. And I just thought, man, if Jesus is calling all of us to himself, if there's a way I can be a vessel to help people hear that Jesus is calling them to himself, let me do it. And if that means getting on an early flight and flying out somewhere and speaking about my life mm. and maybe sleeping on a hardwood floor, which I've had to do a few times. And if that, if that, if, if, if that helps people understand that God loves them and that he's calling them to himself, it's worth every second. I think, you know, you talk about love and love of God. Um, you know, love gets a, gets a bad rap sometimes mm. because it's in a lot of our pop songs, it's in our country songs, it's, it's uh, you know, the idea of love and, and in love, out of love, fell in love, fell out of love, uh, love gone bad. 90% of our songs are about love starting and then ending and <laughs> the chaos that comes from it and so forth. And then in the Christian world, a lot of times the love is, is a very feeling sort of thing. Mm. Um, you know, uh, or maybe the precious moments Bible type of love. Right. Everything is cute, you know. Right. But that's not the cross type of love. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, and that, that's a different level of love. That's a different degree. Um, what, what message would you say to, to people about, about that aspect of love, the deeper, more, more uh, mysterious mm -hmm. level of real love, real giving of oneself, real laying yourself out there. Yeah, well, I mean, the, obviously Jesus modeled it perfectly on the cross. And so, of course, I always, I, you know, usually if I'm speaking on a stage or something, there's a cross somewhere on the stage that I can point to and reference to. And I just, I just encourage people to gaze at the cross and to think about the sacrifice that Jesus made for them. I mean, that, that to me, that's a great way to start, you know, the, the day and end the day is by just thinking about the love and the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. And when, when we're called to sacrifice and to give our lives for Him, I think the most important part for young people is they're not sure if they actually have the tools to do that. They're not mm -hmm. sure if, if this is not the right time, if God doesn't actually want their sacrifice, God doesn't want their love. When we think about love, I, I think you're absolutely right. The culture has really kind of skewed what love is for us. Love willing the best for the other, willing heaven for the other. I learn about this from my wife so much because I, I know without a doubt she loves me, wants me to get to heaven, and that's the way I love her. I want her to get to heaven. That's our ultimate goal for each other. And so when I talk to young people, it's very, it's very easy to see that they're not sure if the love they're receiving from people around them is the kind of love that they should be. Mm -hmm. You know, you can, you can see when you look in their eyes, they, they, that when they walk into the room, they know that they have relationships in their life that may not be founded on true love. Mm -hmm. And they're just, they're just looking for another kind of love. They're saying, hey, I don't know if, if this love I'm receiving is the right kind, but what else is there? And so that's really all I do. I'm just trying to open up people's eyes to see that there is another kind of love than the love that the world offers, and that's the love that Jesus offers. And he knows them so well that he formed their hearts with his own hands, that, that he knows us better than we know ourselves, and that in him is the fulfillment of all of our desires. You know, and that is a, a, that is a kind of a mysterious thing and hard to understand, but that, that, that in, uh, in him our joy will be complete. I mean, that is, that's the love that we want, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, you're 24, yeah. and you're talking kind of highfalutin and fancy and, <laughs> and theological and everything. How did you get to this point at 24 to have, you know, the, this kind of thought process, this kind of, uh, yeah. this kind of meditation? Yeah, well, I, I joined, so my parents were divorced when I was in high school, and I was, ended up kind of being on my own a little bit in high school, not having really much direction, not having, you know, really anybody taking care of me. And, I, and I, of course, my, my, my parents were always there for me. But I, I, I ended up going on my own a little bit. I sort of sort of withdrew a little bit to try to try to just deal with the things happening in my life. And uh, after after a few years of college, I went and became a life teen missionary. I became a full time missionary, and we lived uh, a missionary formation year that was pr actually pretty monastic in its lifestyle. We we lived a really devout and kind of rigorous prayer life, uh, a lot of works of mercy and, and service projects. So our whole day was you know liturgy of the hours and daily mass and a holy hour and some sort of service and outreach. And for a year, I was really withdrawn. I lived up in the mountains at a, at a life teen camp and didn't, didn't use my phone very much, didn't use the computer very much for a whole year. 
I uh, did some, you know, an, 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 an uh, Ignatian silent retreat and uh, those kind of things. I'm sorry, I have this visual of you up in a mountain, <laughs> big scruffy beard, <laughs> no phone, no computer, just hunkered down, <laughs> chopping wood, holding your staff, yeah. meditating and praying. <laughs> yeah, Was it I did. Like that? <laughs> I did chop some wood. Unfortunately, I, I really cannot grow a beard, no matter how much okay. time I spend in the mountains. But, <laughs> but I, yeah, it was, and, and it really it taught me how to withdraw, how to listen to God. I mean, I, mm. I took a lot of the wounds that I had kind of gained along the way throughout my life, and I really took them to Jesus that year. And it was a full year to just reflect, to discern, to, to sit at the foot of the cross, you know, before. And, and I always felt that God was calling me to do something, to, to kind of be a missionary with my life. But I knew before being sent out as an apostle, I really had to spend time with him as a disciple. Mm. And that year changed my entire life because I remember having a distinct thought before I went. I said, I can continue with college and I can keep learning and get a degree, but I don't know how to be a man. And I don't think college is going to teach me how to be a man. I need to find out how to be a man. And, and so I joined this missionary year with the hopes that, that I would learn a little bit more about what a man of God does. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that was that was my hope. And it really helped me. And you had said earlier you know, for the show that that one of the things that really is on your heart is is trying to reach out to guys, young guys in particular, and help them understand, partly because of your upbringing, that you had some some difficulty in that department. Yeah, with, with father, with you know your father and such. And you think, you know, there, you see a lot of guys out there that are also confused about, you know, what is the term authentic masculinity is thrown around a lot. But really what it is, is looking in the mirror and identifying with, you know, if God may be a man. What, what, what does that mean? Right. You know, yes. So many people are confused about what it is to be a man. I think with the divorce rate being so high, a lot of young men, maybe more than people realize, a lot of young men are being thrust into a situation where they're the man in the house mm -hmm. and they might be. 12 or 14 or 16 or 18 and, and all of a sudden they're they're the oldest guy in their house they don't have that father figure a lot of young men i talk to all, all over the country are struggling with what does it look like for me to be a man and for me to be the man in my house and still be able to be a teenager and try to learn and deal with the things i'm dealing with i just think that there there are two approaches i mean obviously and that i i um, i talk about it a lot in my book about saint joseph how there are different versions of manhood out there and, and my book is really just a plea for the reader to Take a look at the version of manhood St. Joseph laid out, you know, mm -hmm. this, this godly version of manhood, because there are so many versions. If you watch movies and TV and listen to music, right. there are so many different versions of manhood, but this manhood brought on, uh, or this manhood displayed by St. Joseph and obviously by Jesus shows that there's such a deeper commitment. And I think that uh, a lot of guys, they really want to be a defender and a protector, and that is so fantastic. And I, I remember I was uh, speaking to a guy uh, a young man after a retreat I did uh, last year. Uh, I'm not sure where it was, I can't remember, but he was, I was speaking to him about his desires for his faith life and he said, I just want to be a defender. You know, my, my dad's not in the picture. I just want to be a protector. I want to be a defender. I want to be strong. I want to be courageous. I want to, I feel like I need to be the savior of my house, you know? Mm. And that line when he said, I feel like I need to be the savior in my house, that really struck me and, and I tried to encourage him because I, I was really blown away by right. him, you know? I said, right. I said, look, man, that is so fantastic that you want to do that. You want to be strong. You want to be the defender and protector. But the, f the thing you have to remember, stay rooted to your defender, your protector, your savior. And I think that uh, there's a tendency, even, even, even in the faith, for men to think that we need to be so strong and so courageous that we don't need saving. Hmm. You know what I mean? And, uh, man, that, that's, that's pretty backwards. I think yeah. one of the most masculine things you can do is, is admit you need a savior. You know, right. and, and to, to rely on, on God as our defense. I don't, I don't think that we need to defend God so much as he, he defends us every day, right, you know? Right. Yeah, something about, you know, our job is to proclaim, to spread the message and to help others find Christ, you know, the Great Commission in Matthew 28, to go out to the ends of the earth and baptize all nations, mm. you know, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and also to, in, in, you know, teach the commandments that the Lord instructed them in. In other words, to love their souls enough to bring them to Christ, not because Christ needs the defending so much, but the souls that are, that are out there thirsting for Christ and Jesus is saying, now, go get them. Go right. get them and bring them to me. Right. I'll give you everything you need. My grace is sufficient, mm. which is a really great scripture to remember what our Lord tells St. Paul, that my grace is sufficient. I mm. have everything you need mm. to, to, to help you accomplish anything and everything. But you're right. We have to go to him first. First things first, second things second. So you do a lot of work with the, with the young guys and you encourage them in this. And that's obviously close to your heart because you have been through those struggles yourself. And now that you're a husband, um, th that has to change the dynamic just even in the last few months 
or two months or so, two and a half months, of how you speak to the young guys or what you're even thinking. Yeah. What, what, what kind of transformation have you noticed in yourself Maybe as you're speaking to the young guys, you're thinking about what you're going to say to the young guys. Yeah, that well, you're a, f a husband. Yeah, it, it has changed drastically. I mean, first of all, I have this whole new meeting when I'm in mass and I hear the phrase, "This is my God. This is my body given up for you." I think, man, the way that Jesus laid down His life and the way that I'm called to lay down my life for my wife now is so powerful. It moves me to tears often because I, I think, man, I'm so unworthy. I really need His grace and His help and His strength to be able to do that. And I think for young men, my my encouragement to them is, hey. God has a plan for you. You know, I think they need to know that love is more than a feeling and that our, our Catholic faith is more than a religion. It's a relationship and that holiness is more than a suggestion. It's a calling. Mm. It's a calling that we've all been given. So as, I think when they can embrace that, the way that it's changed, the way I reach out to them is I recognize now that as men, we want to find something bigger than ourselves and lay down our life for it. I mean, that really is our innate desire. To, uh, we spoke about it before the show, this desire to, to be, be a superhero, you know, to, right. to, to rescue. We, we want to find something, a cause where it's bigger than ourselves and to give our lives for it. I mean, Father, obviously you model it in your, in your priesthood and you, you, you model it as a, as a father of children. And I, I hope to do that someday. And, and you, you don't do that because you like not having to pick an outfit every day. There was a much greater purpose <laughs> for you becoming a priest. It was because you found something you'd, so much bigger than yourself. You'd be surprised the agonies that Doug goes through <laughs> over his wardrobe. Oh, I have to. I have, my wife jokes around. You have like five shirts you pick from. Just rotate them out. <laughs> yeah. It's easy for father. Same color. You know? Yeah. Get seven habits hanging in the closet. Let me see. Which one should I go with? I think I'll go with the brown today. Yeah, uh, it makes it easier. But you do the same thing. I mean, you, you didn't. You didn't have children because you would rather spend Saturday or Sunday at a little kid's birthday party than watching the game. It's just part of it. But you didn't do it because of that. You did it because you found something greater than yourself and you're laying your life down for it. And I, I, that's what we all want. So these young guys, that's what they want. Yeah, I think you see that a lot with the young guys too. When you, you see you know, th th that kind of DNA, it's written in our DNA to be the hero, mm -hmm. how it's expressed will vary to some degree, you know, depending upon the calling and the personality and the charisms, charisms that God gives one. But it is still in us. And a lot of guys want to live that out on a football field by making that heroic catch, slow motion, pull the football in, right. keeping two feet in the end zone. Yay, and the crowd cheers. <laughs> He's a hero. Yeah. Or, or, you know, jumping on a landmine and saving everybody in the foxhole, you know, or, or hand grenade. There's something in us. We, we watch the movies about that. And it, it's not going to manifest the same in everybody except in the area of love, love being that qualifying point that everything, you know, uh, stretches from and and comes forth from that aspect of love and that seemed to be what really struck you first and foremost was there you were before love himself in adoration and boom everything just came alive and was ignited right there right and the gentleness of Jesus and the gentleness of St. Joseph too but the gentleness of Jesus the way that he had a tender and compassionate heart that was what struck me the most because I think we all want that hero we all want that superhero that big masculine warrior and St. Joseph doesn't have any of those lines in scripture you, right. we, it's like why can't he just have one good one liner every why can't he just be like you know Herod eat my dust and, you know like yeah. we just want yeah. one line but we don't we don't get it from Joseph in scripture but we we get so much about how to be a man and or, when, or when he's leaving Nazareth to go to Egypt he could say I'll be back right right <laughs> yeah. Yeah. because he comes back all yeah. right um, but yeah right on right on the, right on the spot there that big masculine strength that we see in the physical is really expressed by by the, the, the humility of the spiritual mm. you know the, the humble heart of Joseph I is th that strength, that masculinity. Yeah, I think you see it like in his wrestling with that decision of what to do right. with Mary. He, you know, he wants to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. And I think that is at the core of, you know, men wanting to do the right, you know, yeah. they, they feel this urge to do that. It, yeah, it, it's yeah. fulfilling the duty mm -hmm. in, in, its, in virtue, you know, right. in, yeah. in whatever circumstance they've been given yeah. to do. We're going to run to a break now. And when we get back, we'll have one more segment with Dom. So don't go away. We're back after this.
And we're back to our final segment with Dom. You are speaker extraordinaire, author, and your wife is a singer. How have the dynamics of your, the two of you working together in ministry really changed now that, now that you're doing this more together? But yeah. you're still separate. You still do separate, uh, yeah. separate uh, events, but, but you're together now. The, the marriage, the grace of marriage, I mean, it, it, marriage is like, it, is a new entity, you know? The three of you now, you know, God, you and your wife is saint, almost saint, I should say, sorry. Um, <laughs> Archbishop Fulton Sheen in his book wrote, Three to Get Married. Mm. Um, as soon as they work out the details of certain things, they'll canonize him. <laughs> but uh, yes, the, uh, the three to get married. You're now married. There's a new dynamic. There's a new grace. There's a new energy flowing in this, this sphere of your marriage, your new entity. How has that affected your two ministries? Yeah, well, first of all, we save a ton of money on hotel rooms, which That's has awesome. been fantastic. <laughs> That's and for good. event hosts as well. Yeah, it's been yeah. fantastic. But yeah, it has changed a lot. We've been able to do a, f a few <laughs> events as a married couple now, and it, it changes everything. I mean, first of all, we're able we to... You said your wife's name? Sarah. Sarah, Sarah, Sarah Kroger. Kroger. I, I yeah. mentioned the first name okay. just briefly. Sarah yeah. Kroger is the same. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so so we, we've... I mean, I, like I said earlier, we, we love being able to offer the package of me, me bringing some sort of message and her leading everybody in worship. To do it as a married couple has been an amazing witness uh, first of all, to us, to be able to give of ourselves as a married couple in that way has been incredible because you, you, when you're working together, obviously in ministry or in anything, you have to communicate. And mm -hmm. a lot of times if, if it's during a talk or during a song, you have to communicate basically silently. So we've been working on our, on our communication, which obviously is always good in a marriage. And the other thing too is... Well, I'm sorry. Some would say the longer you're married, you'll communicate silently even better, right? <laughs> 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 anyway, I hope so. I sure hope that's the in case. In good and bad ways, right? <laughs> <laughs> the audience is like, oh yeah. Anyway, go ahead. Yeah, no, it's it's fun. It's really fun because you know, first of all, one of our big messages that we always try to to give the people that we get the opportunity to, to speak to is love one another. Mm. And so to be able to witness to that as as a married couple is incredible. I the st first of all, the stories I can share now and the stories that she can share. Now we have that uh, that extra added challenge of having somebody else in your house, and mm -hmm. you know, and and you know, the person that you had used to have the butter not used to still have the butterflies for, <laughs> but the person that you used to be all googly eyed over, now yeah. they're actually there all the time, and you know, and 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 so there's the extra challenge of loving each other even when it's not just a special weekend thing. Now it's every day through the right. through the grind through the in and out. It's really taught me so much about the the consistency of. Uh, or, or how consistent and how constant God's love is that every morning, every night, all day, He is watching over us, He is with us. And my wife, the way that she loves me so constantly throughout all the ups and downs of life has taught me so much about God's love. Yeah. And so when we're, when we're witnessing to people about that, I mean, first of all, teenagers love the fact that we're married. They, they just freak out about it every time we say it. And, you know, the girls come up and want to look at her ring. And, and, and the girls all say, oh. And the girls say, whoa, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. 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 And so yeah, the, the, normally the guys are upset. They all think that she's really pretty, well, she is. And so they, normally I actually have security detail when I'm at events with her because I do think some of the guys want to kill me, uh, which is fine, you know. But I, it's, just, it's interesting because we've been able to share our beginning of our married life with mm -hmm. random people we meet at events. And we, we're, we kind of try to be open with them, try to say, hey, here are the things that, we, that we've already struggled with. Here are the things that, we, that we've seen that God is so faithful in. And we're able to share you know, our marriage in some respects with, with young people all across the country, hopefully give them something to look forward to. You, yeah, know? you said something a few moments ago that reminded me of something you had said many moments ago before the show about one of the things that was really on your heart or that is on your heart is about the role that we have and in, in, in the responsibility we have to, to love others, mm. to love their souls, and to really, you know, to use the term, to go get them right. and bring them to Christ. And you had said something before the show about it's easy to look at our faith as just about how I am and how I feel and how I'm connecting with God. And you've talked about this too, Fathers, that the responsibility we have to not just take from the church mm -hmm. and take, but that we have a responsibility to give and to go out and get others mm -hmm. in that respect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So no, talk I, about, I mean, just a little bit about, about the fact that, that we are called to go out. And you, you, you're you describing you and your wife doing that now as a team, but, but we have a duty to go right. out and to bring souls, to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself, which means we have to go out and, 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 and communicate and interact and meet with the neighbor to bring them 
the truth right. of Christ. Right. I've actually been thinking about this. We just moved to a new apartment complex. Obviously, when we got married, we moved in together. And, and I don't know my neighbors right now. I haven't gotten a chance to meet them, which really bothered me in my last apartment. I knew, I knew my upstairs neighbor, got it left, got it right. I knew their stories and it was going on in their lives. I, I really think it's important to know the people who God put directly around us. And it's a really strange thing, you know, from, from traveling and speaking, you get in a plane and you fly over a bunch of people to go to some other people. And you're like, well, I, I miss the people that we just flew over, yeah. you know? And so I really think it's important to, to love who God puts in your life. I mean, we, we have to get along. God put us on this earth together. And on the plane. You know, and there's all these the people on the plane. So what I, I started big group sharing sessions on the plane now when I fly. <laughs> Grab the mic. I just say, okay, everybody, let's talk a little bit. You in 11C, tell us, tell us your story. And it really does open people up quite a bit. Yeah, no, that, I can imagine that would be yeah. really pleasantly awkward, but yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah. Uh, that and wine right, yeah. opens them up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it just, we're, we're called to love one another, I think. And, and anybody who's alive in the church can see that so many times people criticize the church because they met a Christian who didn't act like Jesus. Right. And I just think, man, what a tragedy. Yeah. You know, what a tragedy that, that we represent Christ on our t-shirts or on our necklace or something, but we don't represent him with our actions, with our words, you know? And yeah. so I, I just think it's so important to, to love one another. And I always encourage, you know, when, I, when we're, Sarah and I, when we're talking to young people, we can share with them that, hey, what, what happens on the stage up here is not all that we do. You know, Sarah and I might be on a stage together proclaiming, God, you know, the good news and, and singing about him and, you know, preaching about him. But that's not really the most important thing we do. The most important thing we do is when we love each other and love the people around us through thick and thin every day. I think that to some people, God gives a stage and we're on a stage right now. And to some people, you know, like when you go out and speak, he, he gives you a stage for that day to speak from. But all of us, God gives a platform, mm -hmm. you know, the platform to with which to love and to, to know and love and serve God and to, to know and serve and love others. Yeah. So no matter, no matter if, you, if God gives you a stage or not, He definitely gives you a platform. And that could be your workplace, it could be definitely your family, definitely the kitchen table to walking down the hallway past a sibling to right. any of those areas, the hallway at school, um, you know, the factory line, uh, the cafeteria, uh, passing the cashier in the grocery store and asking them how their day is going. Never forget the conversation I got with a lady, ask her if she liked her job, how are things going here, a little frustrated. Turns out she was worried about one of her sons who had just been mm -hmm. called up to go to the Middle East. And, uh, mm -hmm. and I both told her by the end that I asked for his first name and said I'd be praying for him. And her face just lit up, really? Well, yeah. And it was a way just to, to reach out to the cashier in the grocery store. But it was, it right. was, it was valid, very valid. I mean, she, she's an individual. We pass each other sometimes. So like ships passing in the night, as the saying goes, and, and we just kind of toot a horn. Hey, what's up? How you doing? How's your day going? Good. Right. You really want to know how my day is going? Let me tell you. Okay. You know, so <laughs> I really didn't mean it when I asked you how your day was going. <laughs> right. You know? So, uh, okay. So where do you want to see this go? We've got three minutes left. Um, where do you want to see this go with your ministry? Where do you feel God's calling it? You, your wife now working together and you know, years to come, God willing. Yeah, I think, I think God is definitely calling Sarah and I to continue. And the only reason I say that is because uh, it continues to be so fruitful. He continues to remind us that he could do it without us, but that he chooses to bless us by letting mm -hmm. us be a part of it. Uh, he, you know, and he continues to, to provide. We don't, you know, there's just always, we keep being invited places. And he continues to provide opportunities for us to love and serve. And so hopefully it continues. Obviously we're new as a married couple, only two and a half months. So we're gonna grow and figure out what the most effective way to minister as a married couple is. Obviously when we have kids on the way, maybe the, that, that will change a little bit and we, one of us might have to stay home or something like that. But I think that we're, we're just, we just wanna continue to grow. As the more that I develop um, what's on my heart, I wanna continue to share it. And that, that's the beautiful thing about what I do. I don't talk about a fashion trend that's gonna go out of style. Mm. I talk about a relationship and an encounter with Jesus. That, that's really all I'm qualified to talk about. Mm. And you know, Jesus is, he's gonna be around longer than I am. So I'm always gonna have yeah. something to talk about. It's a pretty safe message, 2000 years, Christianity, and even before that, just the presence of God, the Trinity in the world. Uh, just a couple minutes left. How can people get a hold of you? What types of events uh, are you open to presenting or speaking at? Yeah, so domqualia.com. My, my, my name domqualia.com, or I can also have like a Facebook page. Why don't you spell the qualia for the radio audience yes. out there? Yes, Q U A G L I A. Dom Q U, Q -U A G L I A. Okay, so D, D O M. Yeah. Q U A G L I A. Yeah. Dot com. Dot com. And I okay. do I do retreats and conferences, youth rallies. Par we do a lot of parish missions, Advent, Lent, all that kind of thing. 
And uh, so we do pretty much anything where there's a, a gospel to be, to be proclaimed and songs to be sung, we'll do it. Uh, and obviously the goal is, and we talked to Father about my, my hero, St. Joseph, and he was able to do it without saying a word in scripture. So uh, if, if I never get to touch the microphone again, my, my goal is, or my hope is that I will still be an effective proclaimer of the gospel, whether I can do it on a stage or just a platform God gives me every day. So. Yeah, and you will be simply by being a faithful, loving husband Amen. and God willing father and uh, taking care of that bride. And as we know, our, as husbands and fathers, our goal, number one, first and foremost, is to get our wife to heaven. Anybody married, that's our first and foremost goal. Do everything we can to prepare our spouse to stand before God. Amen. Dom, God bless you. Thank Great you, work, buddy. Keep Appreciate it up. It. Father, father, as only you can take us out. May our Heavenly Father shine His face upon you. May He give you His peace. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We'll see you next week on Life on the Rock.